my nakshatra in this okay namaste everyone my name is vishali shah you're watching me live on uh, hinduscriptures.com facebook page as promised uh, we have very interesting speakers bunch of speakers today uh, and uh, without taking much of your time i would like dhruv chitralya to come forward and say few uh, prayers because before starting a session i always would like to recite prayers and i think eve and melissa are also going to join so dhruv namaste melissa ji namaste eve ji namaste aapka bahut bahut swagat hai in this session uh, yeah. please share a small prayer before we start our session yes um, i i i'm going to get melissa ji to do a opening prayer but because you've asked me to do so uh, words can never be taken back so i'll just start with a short one and then pass it over to melissa ji so ओम सर्वे भवन्तु सुखिनः सर्वे संतु निरामय सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कश्चित दुखपाग्वपे ओम शान्ति 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 दैट मींस ओम मे ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड प्रॉस्परस मे ऑल बी हेल्थी मे ऑल सी ऑस्पिशियसनेस एंड मे नो वन सफर ओम पीस 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 द ओवर टू मेलिसा जी न्यवर्ड बाय एम सो आई विल नाउ एक्चुअली रिसाइट द शांति मंत्र and i'll explain why in just a moment om sahana bhavatu sahana bunaktu sahaviryam karvavahe tejasvita tintmastu mavet vishavahe om shanti 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 hi and so what that means is may we all be protected nourished and work together with great energy may our intellect be sharpened and that there be no animosity amongst us peace 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 and i feel that's very fitting today for this discussion as we're all working together for the same aim which is to promote hinduism and our love for hinduism to the youth in the uk and the usa and india why not and everywhere and across the world <laughs> thank you melissa ji that was absolutely beautiful and uh when our rishis in ancient times used to have these samvads these conversation they would always begin with an invocation so we're very very fortunate and blessed to have two um and so, one so beautifully sung by you so thank you melissa ji um yeah so today thank you vaishali ji for hosting us today um melissa ji eg and i have been um, working together on a number of events this year especially on our hindu festivals to share the messages right. of our scriptures and our deities um and why we do certain things in hinduism um this one is a very special one because there's a big big famous festival coming up on the 25th of december which everyone knows that which is gita jayanti um, right. it's, it's a festival that's very close to my heart because my life is all about the bhagavad gita and um i want to inspire we're going to talk about how to inspire the hindu youth in the uk and the us and more generally around the world with um, the power of a powerful message of hinduism but also from my perspective the message of the bhagavad gita so the day of gita jayanti occurs on magshira shukla ekadashi um so it's a very auspicious day the 11th day of the lunar month where the sun enters into the sign of sagittarius in the vedic system and the uh, moon enters into the sign of aries so sagittarius and aries it says it all right the aries is the kurukshetra the battlefield sagittarius is the dharma where the the dharma was preached on the battlefield by shri krishna so today when shri krishna gave the most valuable the richest and his own direct message of the bhagavad gita not just to arjun but the entire human race so the bhagavad gita is not just like a scripture to be worshiped or placed in a, a holy place it's a book of life it's the science of life and it's a book of psychology so there's not a single problem in life for which the solution is not given in the bhagavad gita uh we've gone through a long journey with sham in our tuesday talks that famous tuesday talks in the city and now in parliament of finding out the truths of life through the bhagavad gita and through the preaching of shri krishna so i always feel that the day when each youth because we're talking about the youth today when each youth of the world each individual of the world when each educated person in the world will have the bhagavad gita in their hands the world will not have any problems this is because shri krishna says that the situation may be adverse but it's entirely our choice to be unhappy or not and we unnecessarily draw unhappiness and sorrows towards us in adverse situations and even in favorable situations 
So we're the masters of our own happiness and the masters of our own sorrow. And the Bhagavad Gita he preaches us the key, the science, the process, and the divine journey towards our own happiness, or more importantly, our own bliss, towards our own success in life, and towards our own fulfillment in life by finding out what we call our Dharma. And I'd like to welcome all the young people um, listening today to join this endeavor, which is a divine endeavor. Um, I always like to share thoughts of the Bhagavad Gita, to think about the shlokas of the Bhagavad Gita, and to encourage people to ask questions. And the more people ask questions, then more Sri Krishna resonates with our soul. Um, so my best wishes, first of all, to everyone in advance on this auspicious day of Gita Jayanti, uh, where Sri Krishna preached this divine wisdom to us all. I would like to recite the last um, shloka of the Bhagavad Gita, which coincidentally my name um, comes into there. So just a coincidence, which is, Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna, Yatra Parto Danudana, Tatra Shri Vijayo Bhutti, Dhruva Nitin Matir Mama, which means wherever there is Krishna, the Lord of Yoga, and Partha, Arjun, the archer, I think there will surely be fortune, victory, welfare, and morality. This was said by Samjir, who had a divine vision of the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And so I received many requests to give talks on the Bhagavad Gita, but for me, those are not requests. Just like a child has been waiting for ages and you give the child something in its hand that makes us happy, in the same way, this is an activity that makes me happy. So when people say to me they're grateful to me for giving these discourses, I tell them that you can be grateful to me for anything, but don't be grateful for this, because I'm grateful to you, um, Vaishali Ji, for giving me this opportunity to do what I enjoy. The Bhagavad Gita is a very special Shastra scripture. Because of the Lord's grace, I've read the scriptures of all the religions. But the Gita is such a special scripture that in a, such a small amount of words, only 700 shlokas, and in such an unfailing way, describes the metaphysics of life. Warren Hastings described the scripture as a study of death and killing, and one that describes how one, we can win in life. Relating to this, I would like to say that Eve, Melissa, G, Vishala G, and I are warriors. Um, I have great pleasure in saying this, and I have the full right with great courage to say that we are warriors because we do not like to cry in life. We do not like to run away in life. And we like to go to war in inverted commas. Whenever going to war during my life, whenever I face troubling circumstances, I found inspiration in the Gita. And my situation during these battles can be compared to a familiar situation when you watch films. So when one watches a movie, one becomes so involved that they put themselves in the shoes of one of the characters. For example, you see women using up boxes and boxes of tissues, crying over the plots of sad films because they're so sad. So this experience, they experience what it's like to be one of those poor characters. And this is a very psychologically, a very natural thing for humans to do. So in the same way, I imagine myself in the chariot going to war, in the same position that Arjun was during the Mahabharat. So during the war, whenever I've needed inspiration or willpower, I've seen myself standing in the place of Arjun in that chariot. I thought that Sri Krishna is speaking to me instead of Arjun. And from this process, I've gained great strength. And that strength and power that all of us have gained by reflecting and meditating on the Gita, which has grown over days, months, and years, I now wish to give to you all. I never say that I'm knowledgeable. I never say I'm the rightful spokesperson of the Gita. And no one can say this. I've learned the Gita from various great personalities. I've read, listened to, and thought about, meditated on the various versions of the Gita. And that prasad of that I want to give to the world. So when one looks at society, one has two ways of measuring it. One is the way of materiality and the other is the way of spirituality. So you can measure a person materially and you can measure them spiritually. When you use the way of materiality, you look at what one possesses and this becomes important. Who has what? How big is his house? How many cars does he have? What's his business? How much is in his bank account? How much one possesses and what one has becomes important in materiality. But when you measure someone by spirituality, what you have is not so important, but what you are is important. Who are you? Having does not become important, but being becomes important. And the realization and shape of being is wonderful. And the problems and miseries of the modern age are mainly as a result, in my opinion, of the predominance of materiality and the forgetting of dharma. Because nowadays people are measured by what they have, but not who they are. And every individual wants to prove himself in front of himself first, in front of his family second, in front of society or group, for example, relatives, friends, acquaintances third, and finally, 
in front of the world at large. Every person is trying to prove themselves. And when each person tries to prove themselves, all they see is and all they look for in another person is what that person has got. When the only measure of the person is what he possesses and every one person is trying to prove themselves, then there's only one road left to take. I'll keep gathering what I can. Then the world will respect me. Then the world will adore me, which I'm looking for in other people. So when we talk nowadays of materiality and ask what it is, it's nothing else than everyone trying to prove that there's something. And because they have to gather things to prove that there's something, they gather those things. They run after objects. The person running after objects knows there's nothing in these objects. And I see owners of various objects in front of me. They have many kinds of things. And I meet people who have piles and piles of things. But within, there is something empty. There's always something missing from their lives. Then why run after these things? Moreover, when you find out that there's nothing in these objects, why do they still run after these things? One of the effects of running after objects is that one is not running for himself, but for other people. Once you have an act of objects, one of the effects is that they become worthless. When you have 10 cars in the garage and the 11th car comes, then it hardly makes a difference. No, no one in the house even knows that another car has come. No one knows for 15 days, 20 days. And when the child goes to find a car, they'll ask the driver if it's a new car. So this is affluence. So why does one still run after objects? They're not running for themselves, but for other people. And after running for other people, they become emptier and emptier. And in their heart, there is a feeling of deep sadness. And this is the problem of the modern age for our youths. This was the problem at the beginning of uh, this last decade. This is the problem at the beginning of this century. So why is the Gita necessary today for the youth? Because a few years back, people decided that if we gather these things, we'll be happy. But now they have these things, and yet there's a deficiency. When one is sad because they don't have the objects they desire, that's a very shallow unhappiness. They're without possessions, uh, but when they are sad, they'll have those possessions and they're sad. But when a person is sad when they have those possessions, then the sadness is very deep. When one is sad because they're hungry, then once you've had hand them two chapatis, the sadness goes away. What about the sadness when one's stomach is filled? That sadness is a very deep sadness. So today, fast progress has been very beneficial in many ways and has benefited everyone. 50 years ago, happiness was not as easily available as this. Life was very problematic. So in between all these happy moments, what do I do when I, I'm sad? So there's an ocean of happiness nowadays and the island on which the person is sitting is one of sadness. And never, every now and then one has to come back to the island. When you go to swim in the ocean, you may swim for one hour, two hours, three hours, but you have to come back to the island. You can't keep swimming in the ocean because you're a person, not a fish. And whenever a person comes back to the island after swimming in the ocean, this fury of sadness becomes unbearable. So until now, society has been described by economists as a split of haves, have nots. I want to describe a third type of person, have not in spite of being haves. They have everything, yet they have an experience of not having. And this sadness is a major sadness of young people today. What does the Gita have to say about this major sadness of today? How will Sri Krishna be able to help with it? With that vision in mind, and with those challenges of modern life in mind, we study the Gita. And only then is the Gita useful. Otherwise, we just have five Pandavas, and one of these five Pandavas, Arjun, is standing on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. He doesn't want to fight, and Sri Krishna tells him to fight. What does that got to do with you or me? The war happened, and the Pandavas won. Everything was finished. It all worked out well in the end. Now what? It has no value other than the story. Then why has it remained a major scripture for ages and ages? There is only one reason. Some Bhavami, you get, you get. Sri Krishna says, I come into being from age to age. That is my vision of the meaning of the Gita, because it applies to every battle. So Arjun did not know at the time, 5,000 years later, the words Sri Krishna is saying to him will be meaningful to help us in this respect. But Sri Krishna knew, and that is why Sri Krishna said, Sambhavami Yuge Yuge. It has always been the case that in different eras, the different meanings that the Gita has for different people has always made the listener or reader feel as if the Gita is for them. Only Sri Krishna knew this, and only Sri Krishna knew that the Gita with the supreme being the divine and dharma that we're going to attempt to fully re-establish again 
are we going to do this with the words of the Supreme Being, Sri Krishna himself? Um, in today's times, machines have developed and appreciated, but human beings have depreciated. So we therefore go through a journey of the Gita from a practical perspective. We're not going to just study the scripture, get up and brush our clothes clean. And I'm, going, I'm always bold in my talks that me, the layman, in fact, everyone who wants to just read this book, get up and brush their clothes clean, is probably going to be disappointed. And it's good they'll be disappointed. And I don't recommend that people who just want to be, get up and brush their clothes clean should read this scripture. For those who want to gain something from the scripture, for those who want to gain something from the words of Sri Krishna, and those who want to take their lives in the right direction, I always try with the blessings of Sri Krishna to make sure that those people don't go back and handed. And I always um, study the scripture uh, in chapters, and I always like people to carry the scripture with them. And we're humans, uh, but we're Hindus, but we're humans. And the fact that we're Hindus is additional bonus. And because we're humans, first of all, we must study the Gita. And because we're Hindus, it's a bonus we must study the Gita. And um, it's, it's incredible that Gita hasn't even got the word Hinduism in it, even though it's a Hindu script, it applies to all of humanity. Um, and I'd like to clear up some misconceptions that people say that the Gita is a Bible of Hinduism, and I strongly oppose. It's an insult to the Gita, the Bible, and to Hinduism. The Gita is the Gita, the Bible is the Bible. Comparing the Gita and the Bible is like comparing a pineapple and a mango. Both fruits are different. You can't compare them. You can compare two mangoes, but even if there's two different types of mangoes, you can't compare them. So they're, if they're in a pile, then it's difficult to compare them logically. So how can you compare two scriptures and say that the Gita is a Bible of Hinduism? It's wrong. Um, so that's very, very important. And um, like the Gita, it's been around for a long, long time. Um, it doesn't have the names of any religions, um, like Christianity, because they came later. Um, like if you look at Christianity, it's 2020 years old, because when Christ was not there, Christianity was not there. Islam is 1,500 years old. Uh, Buddhism, Jainism are very beautiful religions, but they're splits of Hinduism. And Buddhism, Malva's teachings are around 2,500 years old. The rest of the religions are relatively new, like 600 years ago, other religions such as Sikhism and came, came. The Gita is a scripture that represents Hindu Vedic Sanskrit thoughts. And for Vedic Sanskrit thoughts and scriptures, we use the word Sanatan. Sanatan is that whose beginning is not known. So we there forever. We don't know where it began. So researchers and scholars all over the world say that the Rig Veda is the oldest existing literature of humankind. We found the Rig Veda, but who knows about the other Vedic scriptures that have been lost through invasions. The scriptures and traditions that have been there from the beginning are best represented by the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so with that in mind, a, a quick introduction to the Gita. I'll pass on to E.G. Um, to describe, um, I, I guess, the importance of the Vedic teachings for our youth. But also, given the occasion, I want you to talk about the astrological significance of the Bhagavad Gita as well. <laughs> Thank you, Georgie. Um, I would just, if anyone would like to interject any time that I'm speaking, feel, feel free, please, um, because sometimes uh, it works well if, you know, if something's fresh in the moment. Um, so uh, I, I would say that as far as let me start with the Vedangas then, because we have the Vedas and then we have the limbs of the Vedas. One question I have, before you start, I would like you to share your journey. How did you get into this learning? Because we are here to inspire the youth and someone coming from different part of the world, if you share something about yourself, you know, how you got impressed, how you, how, what did you find in the scriptures? I'm sure that will help them a lot. So before you start, please share something about yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you. All that, yeah, please. So, um, I grew up in a scientific household, if you'd like to say, and um, very familiar with that language. And for me, it, everything happened around, I would say, 16 or so. I stumbled on some Shiva mantras. <laughs> the time I didn't really know what they were. I mean, I didn't understand, I was just drawn to the sound. And there were various things going on in my life. I had my foot in the door for a 
a record deal, if you would say. I was going into the studio for Warner Brothers very early in 1617 and various big events were happening in my life that don't ordinarily happen at that age. I mean, it was just too much. And I was confronted with my value system and the value that I put it on my body as a woman and um, the value that I felt within myself, even with the music, they were beginning to butcher the music in the studio. Um, I was confronted with very element, very dark elements of the world of producers and, um, and the, the power that they like to <laughs> attempt to take advantage of girls with. And I just wasn't, couldn't happen. And it led to a bit of a depression to be honest, but that depression was, and there were various other things that depression ended me, landed me in India simply from just knowing these little Shiva mantras or this or that. And I was learning Jyotish as well. And my first teacher, uh, astrology teacher, Jyotish, for those of you who may not know, I mean, most people do, but it's a Vedanga of the Vedas. It's, it's technically not just astrology. Um, Western astrology has once again, just really uh, brought down the word astrology. I don't mean any offense, but it really has. I, I was starting to learn this, but I didn't really understand it. Um, so I went to India at 17 and I met my teacher. And this is the beautiful thing about this path. <laughs> Those things like the Upanishads, if anyone has investigated and reading them, or uh, any of the beautiful works that come from the Rishis of India. Those things which are more intelligent than your intellect, those things which we can never explain, like love. <laughs> Just take love. That's the easiest way for people to relate to it. Or music, speaking of music. When you feel that, the Upanishads are designed to get you to experience that all the time through your own process through your own process of self-inquiry. It's the only work of art and knowledge that is designed to rewire the brain in this way that is actually beneficial to our life. Otherwise, everything, every tool we have in modern society is geared to sharpen the intellect, which speaking of the the current astrological alignments, we're about to go into an eclipse. The intellect is the biggest eclipse of deeper intelligence and Western civilization has no leg without it. Th this is a problem. We, the way we're looking for proof. So when I met my teacher, I didn't need proof. I didn't need, I didn't need proof in the sounds of the Shiva mantras how I memorize them overnight, how I memorize the Sanskrit alphabet overnight, I don't know. It just happened. And the intelligence that worked through it, and I say the word intelligence because people treat this almost as if you're, you know, the left brain type or you're the abstract type. And, you know, what can you possibly understand about life through that? You're just creative. <laughs> I get that. I hear that in my family sometimes. Oh, she's the creative type, even though my best subjects were mathematics and science. I got straight A's, <laughs> it is science. I can't always claim mathematics. Science, straight A's, straight A's, and, and a, a highest in my class and in debate as well. So it wasn't that I didn't have a, a sharp quality to my intellect. I knew early on that it was eclipsing me and creating mass depression in my life. The more I had to think and sit here and try to fit into these boxes that we create. And this is everyone right now. We have an epidemic of antidepressants. And I'm speaking about young people. This is really, um, you know, I spent my college years at my teacher's feet, really doing very simplistic work. Um, I mean, like taking dictation, <laughs> taking care of his, his health. Um, and I feel like the, in studying Jyotish side by side that, you know, learning, learning more mantra Shastra um, at his recommendation, doing all the various sadhanas that are recommended in Jyotish in order to learn it properly, you're supposed to actually learn the sadhanas first because they activate the deeper intelligence, 
not because they're a mindless ritual. Sound has a huge effect, deep, deep effect. I mean, they have weapons designed out of sound now. I mean, this there is brilliance in mantra shastra. This is it. Re, it not only rewires. I think better. It it adjusts us to what we naturally are. Most things right now have you looking out, out, out for proof. Proof. I need to verify this. If everyone, there's no logic in that actually, because if everyone got out of bed every day saying, I need proof that I'm going to succeed at this or I'm not going to do it. That's the number one proof that your intellect is eclipsing you and science has become the new religion and it is eclipsing you because there are things that you won't have proof of until you experience them. And the only way to experience them is to approach the doorway of wisdom. The other epidemic we're having, speaking of youth, is a devaluation of age. And the elders in our society no longer know how to be elders. They're not respected. They don't behave to be respected because they're constantly trying to be young. Because we're, we are a market society. There's, even, there's a market value. I've spoke to some dear clients and dear friends lately. I mean, I was so shocked to hear there's a market value when you're dating someone now. So all these apps and all of this, it puts a market value on you. True. Even, even on your, your attractiveness, your sexuality, everything just starts even, I mean, down to everything, you've got a value attached, a number attached. Consumerism, which we call it consumerism. Yes. Everything, oh, yes. <laughs> the motherhood, the parents, the relationship, because that is how we have encased. Otherwise, there is no economy. There is nothing like American economy. If you look at their whole structure of encaching everything, you know, even the air and the water and everything is at a, as a price. Water. Yes. Yeah, that's the problem. Yes, and see, this is this is profound because Jyotish is actually a book of life. It is not an irrelevant superstitious practice. You have to know mathematics and astronomy to practice it properly. You have to have a discerning mind. You cannot just go in and learn Jyotish and pop off these things based on your intuition. That's not what you're supposed to do. You had to be qualified. Now, the book of life, I encourage actually the younger generation to learn these Vedangas, Ayur Ayurveda. This is the way to live in harmony with nature. Why is it being considered irrelevant? It's just brainwashing by a media that is once again, part of the consumerism. So it feeds into that machine and everyone's so brainwashed, they think this way or that, just simplify everything. And then you'll see what's true. So speaking of Jyotish, just quickly to your point, we have something called Rahu Ketu, the North and South Node of the Moon. And anyone familiar with Jyotish is familiar with a million remedies for these guys. <laughs> these guys are feared. They're the ecliptic forces. They, you know, and, but there's a brilliance to this. When you really start learning, when you really start learning, you have Guru or Brahaspati, and then you have Rahu, who are really at opposite ends of some kind of spectrum. And in certain chakras in Jyotish, you will see that they are opponents. And at other, in other chakras, they put them in the same place. Because Rahu is not, this eclipse they're describing is actually the eclipse I'm describing about the intellect. Rahu is the most intelligent graph as far as surface and intelligence. And his society is a consumer-based society. He said to eat without consequence. He just eats. He just consumes anything. He eats constantly without consequences. The Ketu, the south node of the moon, if people don't understand what that means, but that deals with the consequence. So there's one dealing with that without consequence and there's one that's dealing with only the consequence. In the middle there, you have the luminaries, the sun and the moon, which are linked with vision. And they literally are in our bodies medically. You need light to have eye health. You literally, I mean, they're the luminaries. They illumine everything. And in Jyotish, those are our strengthening factors for mind and body. 
So they are the only two that can accurately spot Rahu. It has to do with just simply seeing him. It doesn't have to do with figuring him out and being more clever. It has to do with finding yourself so that you can see what is false. If you don't have a locus of yourself, if you don't have the compass adjusted internal, which the foundation of the Vedas, the foundation of the Upanishads, I should say, because a lot of the Vedic or the Vedas are rituals. They're loaded with rituals. Anyone who reads them, they, they, you know that the Brahmanas and this and that, they're loaded with ritual. That's very important too. These are not irrelevant. I want to drive that home. None of this is irrelevant. If anything, it is more relevant now than it has ever been. And anyone who starts studying nature will see this. So sun and moon spot Rahu. Now Jupiter, where does Jupiter come in? He is the one that gets out of bed and goes, I'm going to take the leap of faith. Meaning that I don't know that I'm going to succeed. But there's nothing but this action. That's why Mars and Jupiter are so friendly in, in Jyotish. If anyone gets that secret, you don't have any faith without Jupiter. You only have the void of the intellect. So Jupiter, his Brahaspati, is the intelligence that allowed Arjuna to hear Lord Krishna. Even what you were saying, Guruji, you realize this whole thing with Aries and Sagittarius is very sacred for many reasons because this is Jupiter's mula tricone. There's a reason why Jupiter's mula tricona is his root power, his root force is in that spot in this place. This is so special. When you involve anything with Mars and Jupiter, it's, it's a very important, it's, it's important. Those things shield you from this Rahu. Now this Rahu though is not, he's, he is the current society. This is the model. And it only leads to emptiness and destruction. There, there's, it's almost common sense. I'm, I'm surprised we don't see it. So anyway, speaking to the Gita really quick, that's the significance here. There's a reason why Gita Jayanti happens at this time and, and to keep it simple and not technical i think we really need to look to who what wisdom is i mean you have the mahabharata where the gita comes from and for those of you even studying jyotish and even some elements of ayurveda you'd be surprised if you read mahabharata you get a lot of secrets mahabharata is the real that's the stuff because gita is part of it <laughs> You've got Vishnu Sahasranamam. You've got some of these very important things happening. And the figure that issues these mantras or the figure like Bhishma, Bhishma Patama is the one reciting the names of Lord Vishnu. Yes. And even the nakshatra show the story of that. It's all Jyotish actually. He even, Bhishma waits for his time of death until the sun is in the proper position. You know, it's like this, this is, it's all linked. And for us to get so disjointed and separated, I mean, Chanakya, this is where he, I mean, for anyone who hasn't studied this history, it's amazing. We celebrate this Alexander the Great character. <laughs> I have no idea why. I mean, if you look at any of these guys, they're tyrants, they're bullies, they're destructive. They just go in and obliterate a, a civilization and, and absorb it within them and modify it. it the, per, the people are left with no identity and Chanakya saw this. And he knew the first rule was don't let India be divided. Don't be divided. He knew that. He knew as soon as he saw the first, first mushrooms popping up out of the ground, the, the fungus, the, you know, it was just destructive. So it was his first thing. And um, this is really, we're really dealing with this somehow where we're celebrating. And Mahabharata is, I would say, Gita is the heart. It's like the beating heart. And then you have the Mahabharata, which is the psychologist. If you want to know real psychology, if you are a, a, going to school for psychology, I would almost beg you as someone who's probably twice your age <laughs> at this point in my life and on my long journey, I would say, do not think that your roots are 
irrelevant in today's society. As a matter of fact, you will become more relevant by studying your roots because you have been robbed. And real psychology is in Mahabharat, in Ramayan. Mahabharat is a masterpiece. And we're, it, those of us who are Jyotish enthusiasts and devotees, we know also that there's a psychology in Jyotish this link because Lord Krishna is the avatar linked with Chandra, the moon. And the moon is the natural fourth house, which is the most intimate place in the horoscope, hidden is the midnight point for the sun, and it's the house of psychology. So perfect psychology in the healing for the moon, which is manas, mind, is happening in Mahabharata. It's two, the fa as a family divided. And every character, no matter how noble, are, they, they're making trouble. It's very deep. It's not like you have a clear hero besides Lord Krishna. And even Lord Krishna has to do some actions that you have to understand properly. It's very deep. It's one of the deepest works ever written. So, um, and to I think, think Vedic, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <this laughs> please, please right. yeah, now I have so many questions to ask you because you have explained quite a few interesting things. And then maybe I'll ask Drew as well later on. Um, my first question is, why did you think about astrology? Because um, that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, reading somebody else's lives, not only your life. Because if you want to, be, to master, you have to understand them more than yourselves. Yeah. So how, why did you think of astrology out of so many other scriptures? Well, what you just said makes me very happy. <laughs> I, the less I can um, deal with this, um, <laughs> the happier I am. Um, uh, quite honestly, this is one of those things that it really has no intellectual verification. I, um, I saw astrology and to me, it was an immediate relationship with the grahas and the, 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 the star systems, the planets. I had some link with that. It, it's undescribable when I would go out at night. I was always up at night as a child. I never had the normal okay. star and the moon. The moon and the star, I, I don't know what it was. I could never explain it until then. But I felt I was getting purified. I felt, I, I felt some kind of purification. So the studying of the studying of Jyotish for me started with the sadhanas. And it wasn't any kind of specific faith. I wasn't the kind of person to have blind faith. And I wasn't raised that way. So for me, it was so, I can hear actually that is where astrology helps the reason i'm asking you this question is a lot of people the modern and the youngsters they think astrology is you know some outdated science and it, if it, in fact they don't even consider that to be a science and because you have studied and i'm so glad that you shared that on this platform because we have a lot of lots and lots of youngsters and i'm trying to inspire them to make them uh, uh, inspire them about uh, the indian uh, way of knowledge so astrology is one of the strongest subject, you know, uh, and astrology, may I just say something right here? Yes, yes. I, I, I want I want to offer them. A, I want to offer them a covet. I want to offer them a, a shield right now. Right. They should be skeptical of what I hear some astrologers say. I want to protect them. I have had young girls come to me horrified of the reading they just received from an elder astrologer who has told them they are inauspicious, that they oh. must do some very terrible remedy. Some of these remedies do make sense. And some of them are actually, I, I don't like keep needing to verify this by science over and over, but that you can. Some of these remedies you can verify. Some of them clearly, you've got to remember how many people have invaded India and what they brought with them. And I, I'm not speaking against any religion here, but Islam, has been very intense, I, I have to use that word, on women. India didn't have this. India didn't have this. And as a matter of fact, there was harmony in the caste system. The caste system right. was, I even hate that word. That word is just horrific. Because the law, when you read the Sanskrit, you were defined by character. At birth, you were pure. And you were defined by qualities and character and what you actually 
your birth, your janma was a mystery until you started coming out showing what you were. They didn't just slap a weapon in your hand. A lot of this came from Islam. So covering of women, the way, so the astrology, what we have now is we have to be careful. There is a search for the original Jyotish because there is a heavy mix of Greek and Persian astrology, Amazing. Persian influenced by Islam and Greek influenced by a culture that was actually ripping India apart. They had no morals, not the same morals. Without morals, you don't have an immune system. You tear at the fabric of your immune system, your, your internal immune system. We have to have some kind of moral code. And when you start doing that, all these sciences get affected. Sure. So Jyotish, I do want to say for the young people, be careful. It's not that these people want to mislead you, but you are not inauspicious. That's impossible. Any of these girls, you're not in us. That is impossible to be inauspicious. You're breathing prawn. You're full. You are pure. You, you, the Atma Jyoti is within every heart. How in the world? Varaha Mahira, one of the greatest astronomers and astrologers of, of Jyotishis of all time. Yeah. who predicted his predictions were just, I mean, this is why he was one of the jewels of the court. His True. predictions were, his daughter actually inherited his talent. There's a whole True. thing around that. If anyone knows, it was actually very tragic um, because of the time period, it was very tragic. Um, but she was the right uh, lineage holder. Right. And at that time, it was already coming into India to oppress women. It wasn't there before. There's yogas in Bharat or Shastra for a female scholar. There's evidence that fem females were taught this and, and the Rishi's wives did. So there's, there's some kind of weird misunderstanding. So anyway, Varha Mahira says the feet of a Brahmin are, is pure. The feet of every Brahmin is pure. Er, the body, the entire body of a woman is pure. He didn't say she's, you know, she needs to go do this, this horrific thing. And I mean, there's, there's some, we need to be cautious with these things. And we have to remember that Sanskrit is not properly translated over into English most of the time. Very poor. Very true. So in Jyotish, when they say Salmya and when they say Kru. the language as well. It's a shortfall of the language because you can't explain everything in English. You know, there is just no words. There are no feeling. Those, those emotions are not there. So it's very difficult to explain those things in English. Um, and one more thing, the, the, the thing which you explain, I really have this question. I want you to also tell me uh, how the astrology and astronomy is connected because today everyone is going gaga over NASA's new inventions and, you know, uh, they have found some new uh, planets and they found the distance between the planets. Please give one example, uh, which is explained in, astronom uh, in astrology, the traditional astrological books, the distance between the planets. I would of like course. you, to, I, mean, I know, but I would like you to say that. <laughs> yes, of course. Let me first say, boy, we are, we've never been there. They can just say it exists and show some image when they hire so many graphic designers. I'm just saying, I'm not saying they're not true, but I'm not saying they're true either. You've never seen it yourself. We need to be careful with what we're trusting. I, I really have to say this. I'm not trying to debunk anything. I'm just saying don't trust so easily. Now, one of the most simple examples of Jyotish in astronomy is the cycle of the moon. Okay. It is the most simple. There's, there's other ones that are more technical, such as the distance between the grahas, the way everything's set up from the outer planets to the inner planets. There's, there's so many things we could go, but you can actually observe this with the moon. Anyone that's a female, track your cycle and track the moon. Track your mood, the moon and the mood. 
Right. Just do it. There is literally a study online. And what I find really sad about this is that we have become a, cal a culture of doubt because of looking for certain kinds of proof. We have mislabeled proof, I'm telling you. <laughs> You're never going to get the kind of proof. Someone can explain to you what it is to be pregnant over and over. <laughs> but until you ha are, are pregnant, you don't have the proof of what it is. You don't know what it is. You can just, you're just mindless repeating something you read in a book. And this is what NASA and all of these things are telling us to do really. I mean, there's proof of things. Remember, I grew up with a scientist. <laughs> okay, my mother, my mother is a scientist for the government. And we have these conversations because even the theory of evolution is a theory. And anyone who goes to against it, they get debunked in the media so fast. They get met with such op opposition. So use your common sense. The moon and the sun have a huge effect on you. You don't have to believe in astrology. You don't have to, they have a huge effect on you. Solar flares have an effect on your mood. The cycles of the moon have, your water retention will change. Your mood will change everything why can an astrologer predict when a child's going to be born when you'll go into labor Kay and Rao's done it numerous times there's he's got a good record with that numerous times it, it's it, there's something we're not understanding about sound and waves and because we're such a society of doubt the minute someone puts up an article a debunking article these fact checker people and, and when you go behind and look at who these fact checkers are, none of them are clean. A lot of times they're not clean. And they're promoting some agenda that you just buy because even this thing with rights, social rights, we are not thinking, guys. We, we need to be careful. So Jyotish falls into that category. We need to think the right way. And to think the right way, we need to follow trusted elders and the problem is we don't have a lot of that happening. We do have them, but because of the way it, consumerism has, has influenced, people are just trying to stay young instead of accepting the grace of age and becoming in that place. So we do have the works of the Rishis. And very commonly when we don't understand it. See now, the minute you feel offended, you're so sensitive, your intelligence is destroyed. No one can sit here and get offended anymore. They're so sensitive. That getting offended is important. I challenge all of you. That getting offended is important. You need to get offended. Then you need to take it and use it with intelligence. Okay? It doesn't mean you stay at this place and you stay sensitive. You'll never learn. You just shut the other person up to make yourself comfortable. And you will never have deeper, deeper wisdom. So when one of these classics offends you, think about it. When someone offends you, think about it. Don't be so quick to cancel that person. or what. Now, there's clearly some things that you do need to stand against, but you won't know what the clear view is unless you yourself can stomach getting offended. So Jyotish, I would say with the relevance here, we... All someone has to do is study Jyotish for a year. Before you start saying it's irrelevant, I, and I also challenge you this too, to Ayurveda and Jyotish, study them just for a year. Even if you do it halfway, you're even going to notice that even if you do the mantras, don't think about it. Don't expect anything from it. Just do it. Do the, just do the action. What's the harm? If it's so irrelevant, what's the harm to try? Just for a year, even just for a year. And what you're going to find so is most think, can't okay. So you really think that ast learning astrology helps to grow uh, your uh, your own self, isn't it? And I think every, um, I, I feel that astrology should be part of curriculum in the school as well, at least the basics of it. So uh, I hope, I mean, I'm sure you agree on that, right? Because everyone should learn this. Though I have never tried to right. learn. <laughs> yes, no, you're absolutely right. All of these things, Sanskrit should be taught in schools. There's evidence that it changes the brain waves. Right. It's one of those 
perfect languages even for computer program. I mean, there's so many things in Sanskrit that's unbelievable. All you got to do is look for, you know, if you need evidence of that sort, then you get one person who writes a paper that debunks it and everyone's up and like, oh, I found that it's debunked. You know, it's like, wait, who debunked it? <laughs> Go down that hole. So, you know, Sanskrit Jyotish is incredible because it gives very deep understanding and humility very deep understanding and humility. It takes away modesty, which is a cloak and a pretense. You're pretending and you're modest. And it equips you with the armor of humility because you start realizing this is not about you. This is about all of us. You will see the connection of humanity so quick studying Jyotish you will see similarities in people with a strong Mars. You'll see similar. It's almost like it's a code. Brahma's code. Brahma's dream. You've seen this image of Lord Vishnu reclining in the ocean with all the bubbles. That image alone is so profound. A universe within a universe within a universe, a dimension within a dimension. Science is just scratching the surface like a baby. There's it's such an immature, it's such an immature a tool. It's not developed it yet. And um, yet we're, we're so quick. <laughs> we're just eating it up. <laughs> I think because, you know, religion had gotten to a point where it was harmful to people. You had the witch burning, the Christianity. You have the, you know, it became an oppressive tool. Uh, to, so, so then you have people wanting to break free of that. And we need to be careful how we break free from prison. Because there's a, there's a way to do it that's intelligent and patient and informed. And there's a way to do it that will actually lay waste to your heritage. And when you lose your identity, you're easy to control. You're just buying their products. I see young people, all the time, they're just wearing shirts with the name of products. It's like worshiping products. You know, what are you, a product? Now you've got a market value. Then you die. <laughs> that was your life. I mean, no, we need, to, we need to say these things. They sound harsh, but they're not. They're out of love. Because if we don't care, people who care often do sound harsh. <laughs> and we don't like it. Because <laughs> once again, we're oversensitized. But people who actually care about you will say something. They'll say something if they see so something's off or something's weird. So I, my, my whole thing about this is Jyotish, for those of you who are inclined, I would say learn astronomy, learn mathematics, be a real, and then investigate Jyotish, because Jyotish, a real Jyotishi needs that. There's a book called The Mars Effect. It's a Western book, but I would encourage everyone to get it that doubts astrology. It was a French psychologist, very educated gentleman who sought out to disprove astrology. And he ended up writing a very profound book on the effect of Mars in successful people's life. That was the one thing that stood out to him was how powerfully placed Mars was in successful people's charts. He, he couldn't explain that away. And the other Graha was Saturn. So I was surprised because it wasn't the moon that stood out to him. It wasn't Jupiter, it wasn't, it, he had some things, but when he started doing clinical research it was Mars and Saturn, and he, he noticed something about their relationship. Because those two together create stress, which is a dynamic energy. And so a lot of successful people will have this kind of stress. And he started seeing that. It's biological. It actually affects our chemistry. It, those of you who have a really powerful Mars, it's, it's usually even obvious. <laughs> you know, like an astrologer, sometimes after they sit with you for a couple minutes, uh, if they're, they've been doing this for a while, they'll know which grahas are operating in your life the strongest. They'll know. It's, it's, it's amazing. And you will know if you just study it. So it's, it's, some, it's got some effect um, that you will immediately see if I would say to apply it. I don't want to give convincing words without saying, I, if this is where the tongue needs to be cut. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I think the main thing we need to keep repeating to people is that don't think something's irrelevant just because you've heard it from articles or some YouTube influencer. 
or some song or some celebrity or are you kidding me you're gonna follow a celebrity for your life strategy we have got really something is there's an illness there's an illness and i can tell you firsthand i mean being in the studio at 17 i was preyed on all the girls were it wasn't i wasn't special <laughs> you become these people don't, don't deserve your respect they, they some of them might but most a lot if you knew what they were why are you worshiping that why not worship even yourself if you don't worship some part of yourself which vedanta tells you to in the right way not the intellect not me as a little person but me i love myself I will not let this person touch me. You know, this is not, I don't want this. I love myself. It, it doesn't even take that much. It's finding that core center. So Jyotish really illumines that. And it can also really, when you start getting into the deeper aspects, these guys had a brilliant way of telling you what time a certain ritual should be performed to be successful or when an action should be initiated to be successful. Thank you, Eve uh, Very, very beautiful. I'd like to turn the attention to Dr. Melissa. Um, and I want to ask Dr. Melissa about her journey into Hinduism, how she got into Hinduism, and if the Bhagavad Gita played a role in that, um, the influence of the Bhagavad Gita in your life. And also, what do you think about the situation of the Hindu youth, not just in the UK, but in India? And um, Eve raised some very, very valid concerns about and the, the way the culture is heading for these YouTube influencers, for these celebrities, the way we're, we're looking up to the people we should be looking up to, and the way role models are changing. So, just want to get your thoughts towards that. I'm also that. eager to know, Melissa Ji, I'm also eager to know how did you become Melissa Kapoor? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and thank you very much, Drupji, Eve G. You both spoke so, so well. Um, I always feel humbled to be then speaking at the end of it. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, that's in my story. Um, so I am completely British. Um, my parents are, have European heritage, um, but brought up as a Christian, quite mildly, um, like most Christians really in the UK. It's it's not very a, a strong religion in the UK. It, it really is you know, dying away. Um, you know, the people that are attending church nowadays quite regularly, they are elderly people and they're not being replaced by younger people. Um, so yes, Christian-ish background, but really I was just very studious, very hardworking, and I did a lot. Namaste. <laughs> oh, I see a little oh, one there. <laughs> <laughs> namaste namaste yes um yes so very studious very hard work and did a lot of sports um and overall was you know a very accomplished person very quite confident quite happy I felt um so there's something really missing from my life but by the time I had you know finished school gone to university and then done a PhD I came, I came to realize that actually life felt a little bit dull, a bit gray. Um, and during my PhD particularly, I almost felt like there was some sort of like sensory deprivation because I was just going into my office every day and coding on my computer and going back. And I, I mean, I saw a lot of sport as well, but overall life just felt, yeah, dull, gray and lacking senses. <laughs> um, also, I felt I was very much molded that society, the upbringing I'd had, had molded me into a certain person who had views just because I was told they are the acceptable views. Um, and the final sort of slight downside I, I can see now with retrospect on who I was back then was that I was very much sort of rejecting femininity. And I think that is because in the West, you know, there has been this need to address femininity in some way, because for centuries, women were so oppressed, you know, genuinely, seriously oppressed. Um, and so there's been this like um, bounce back the other way, a reflection completely in 180 degrees, where either you become ultra, ultra feminine, 
or you completely reject it. And I went to a school, a grammar school for girls where we were told really, you know, you had to compete with the men. Um, so we had to almost, it felt like, choose science and technology and maths to study, even though at school, actually my best subjects were the arts. Um, but you know, I went on to study physics and then I did a PhD in statistics. So you know, I was sort of in that mindset that to be successful in life, you had to compete with the men and go into those sort of male dominated spheres. So that's who I was. Um, then I met my husband um, and I came to learn about Hinduism, you know, quite slowly to begin with, although actually I guess it isn't too slowly because I only met him, I think it's about six and a half years ago now. Um, we've been married, uh, I think is it four and a half years, nearly five years. Um, so my journey is still very young and I feel like I've learned a lot and you know, become a strong Hindu in, in you know, quite a short time. But you know, that transformation has come about so easily for me for a few reasons. So I'll go through what those reasons are. Um, so one is that you know, I went from that place where I said well, it was a bit dull. I was kind of felt like I'd been molded into who I was into realizing you know, there's a whole sort of, it was almost like a whole other world to discover. At first it was just coming to India and seeing the colors and tasting the food and seeing all the singing and dancing and just being like, oh my goodness, from sensory deprivement to just sensory overload, <laughs> it was like quite amazing. And just gave me a whole new lease of life. Um, so at first it was quite sort of superficial things, I guess that I found really, um, that I, re I really embraced. But then later on, through learning myself about Hinduism, you know, the deeper aspects, um, I came to appreciate it on a whole, on a completely deep level then. Um, you know, re learning, reading the Shastras, um, or even at the beginning, it was just reading the Amar Chitakata comics. And then it was watching the Mahabharat you know, TV series. And now I'm finding on to actually trying to read the Srimad Bhagavatam myself now. So it's been a bit of a process to get to the point of actually being able to read the Shastras. Um, but also just, I think what, in a major way, what it's done is it's rewired my brain to understand and love all of life. Um, and I know that sounds bizarre, but before, you know, I enjoyed life, but it wasn't like I, I loved life. And, and I think it's because as a Hindu, you realize everything is alive, everything is connected. And that is just so powerful. And when you look at the old Hindi films, um, the songs in there, they always include the word zindagi. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Like when you compare to in the West, the songs are all about you know, love and lust and all of this. There, they're about zindagi. Um, so they're about life, celebrating life. Um, I mean, unfortunately, in modern times, Bollywood films, they're like the Western films, but yeah, the old Hindi films aren't. Um, so another benefit I had, I've had, and I guess this is where the Bhagavad Gita comes in, Paya, um, is my mental well-being. As I said before, I was quite you know, happy and confident before I just learned about Hinduism and became a Hindu, but I feel like it's taken me to a whole new level of mental strength becoming a Hindu. So firstly, I mean, I guess my introduction to it came from listening to lectures on Vedanta at first. And I was really finding it was helping me to put things into perspective. You know, anything that had been troubling me at work that day, listening to these lectures and those worries kind of just drift away because it kind of put things into perspective. It helped me to realize, you know, that I'm not such a big person. You know, my worries are just something I'm experiencing in a very transient way. Tomorrow, I'll probably have forgotten about them anyway. And ultimately, I'm just this one small person in a much bigger cosmos where, you know, there are, as E.G. mentioned before, you know, Hinduism is very cognizant of there being multiverses, of there being an you know, infinite space of time scales being you know, massive and, and cyclical. Um, and that's really empowering when you come from a Christian background because growing up in the UK as a Christian, it almost felt like everything that's ever happened in the world has happened in the last 2000 years. 
And so suddenly having your 2000 years broaden out to billions and trillions of years old, and when you, you know, again, when you're reading the Shastras, you know, there are so many zeros on all these numbers that you're reading about time scales. It's just mind blowing. So going from 2000, a very narrow view on existence to this massive view. Again, it just helps you to realize you're not so important that anything you're worrying about that day, you know, there's nothing really worth sweating about too much. It's not that important. Um, and so another way in which um, I felt that the, the transition to Hinduism was so easy for me is because of actually my science background, and we've touched on this already quite a lot, EG did, about, um, you know, just how you can validate so much of the knowledge within Hinduism using modern day scientific tools, using telescopes, uh, microscopes, etc. And understanding that on the one hand, you have the Abrahamic religions, which are essentially dogmas. You know, you've got like rules, very black and white written down. And then you've got modern day science which is you're making observations on the world and making inferences based on data. But Hinduism is science plus plus. It's right at the other end of that spectrum where you're not only making observations on the world, but you're making observations from within and it's based on experience. So again, I found that so empowering as a scientist to think, well, before I thought you know, science was the pinnacle of knowledge and you know, the methodology for validating anything, but then realizing actually, no, that in itself is very limited. There's a whole other way and you know, dimensions to all of this um, through experience. Um, another, I guess then really now touching on the Bhagavad Gita is understanding about um, detachment and how to see ego. Um, I, Coming Hindu has really helped me, again, when I'm having any worry, just to think, okay, well, the only reason really I'm worrying is because I'm, I'm gonna, I worry I'll get embarrassed or, you know, I'll feel humiliated. It's just my ego getting in the way. You know, what is the point of worrying about this? This is something I can completely just get rid of in a snap second. It's up to me to do that. And then finally, um, I guess coming again from a Christian background, realizing that we're all already saved. Obviously, in the Abrahamic religions, you almost have to prove yourself to get to heaven. Otherwise, you're going to go to hell. Um, but in Hinduism, nobody is going to hell. Nobody's damned, particularly not because of what they believe um, when it comes to you know, that, that uh, sort of supernatural existence. So everyone's just on their journey of discovery and self-development. And that really resonated with me, you know, looking at every individual and being able to see, okay, well, they made that decision or they responded in that way, but they're on their journey. They have to learn certain lessons. And along the way, they'll be picking up karma and, you know, make, learning from those lessons and then helping to reduce their karma. And ultimately, though, they are saved. Um, so for all of these different reasons, I felt it's really helped me to just be able to manage my day to day life really well, um, so to set up my own company, um, to manage family issues um, and to speak out on social media um, as English for Hen, which I, you know, I do. I'm very passionate about speaking out for Hindus um, and it's given me the courage becoming a Hindu to speak out, to have strong views. To actually see things without um, being worried about um, what other people think about me, firstly, being worried about you know, being considered wrong um, and just being okay to speak against the popular view, because there are some you know, popular narratives out in the world today. And to realize, actually, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm wrong. But if I'm saying, thinking something different, that's OK. If I can see the truth, the, the logic in what I'm thinking, that's worthy of being spoken out to. Um, and so that's why you know, becoming a Hindu, I felt, has just given me so much more confidence. Um, and Hindus are very brave. And you have to look at you know, history. And there are so many examples of brave Hindus, um, even in the women. Um, Jansi Kirani, Ahilya Bai Holkar, Rani Durgavati, there's so many 
examples um, and it's so different as I said in the west where before women were so oppressed they had to be seen as meek and mild and then the reaction has been to either go ultra feminist or to go to completely reject feminism but I now realize I can be a strong brave woman because that is what a very balanced human woman should be like you know you should have all emotions and be courageous and strong um, so that really is my um, uh, so my a description of my journey into Hinduism. Vaishali ji, did you, I did I see you pointing, uh, yeah? I have one very, very um, question, one very interesting question. You know, you come from a background where you did not uh, uh, miss anything in life. So a lot of people come towards Hinduism because they had some issues. But as I can understand from your life uh, sketch, you did not come to Hinduism because you had some uh, some major, you know, accident or something, something which was more sad. But um, when you have a fulfilling life, and then then also you come to, um, you know, you try to know Hindu scriptures and all. So that particular emotions, I want you to explain that when you have everything. So what is missing that would you know fetch you towards Hindu scriptures? I want that. To be, you know, sure. to get exposed by you. Yeah. Okay. Very good question. Um, and as I said, yeah. So definitely, I didn't feel that anything was missing, but I think it was yeah. upon discovering Hinduism, it was almost like it opened up a whole other possibility or whole other level of existence that I didn't even know could exist before. So as I said, it was really on ref like hinds with hindsight or in reflection. I could see that previously you know, life seemed so dull and grey before that I was so scared to speak out. At, at the time then I wasn't really seeing it, it's only really in hindsight in when I you know, under, you know, got to visit India, got to learn about Hinduism, become and um, enjoyed being a Hinduism so much that it's opened up this new level of possibility um, you know, as I said before, I was actually quite a confident person before, but that's now a whole new level. You know, being able to speak on this platform today, um, you know, it requires a lot of confidence, a lot of bravery, actually, um, when, especially when you've only been knowing about Hinduism a few years. Um, so you know, Hinduism in that way, it just opened up a whole new level of possibility to me. And that's why I'm so passionate about others learning about Hinduism and becoming Hindus. And not only that, but for Hindus to become stronger Hindus or to reconvert it into Hinduism. True, true, true. Yeah. Very true. Because that is the whole idea about uh, having you guys on our page because we have quite a few Indian followers and uh, they, they, they somehow, I mean, if, for example, when I was in India and in Mumbai, I always tell this thing to my speakers that if I look around, uh, you know, and talk to people, I'm very sure that I won't find even one person knowing anything about Vedas or uh, Mahabharata or any of our script, any of this, these scriptures. I'm very sure about that. Uh, when I, I took my son to the school and I found that just can you imagine one and a half years old and he's forced to learn Spanish along with English. <laughs> And then there is no Hindi, there is no Sans Sanskrit is completely out of the question. The whole ecosystem in India itself is so bad as an inter when it comes to learning things that I want them to understand that how much Sanskrit is important. So, uh, and I'm sure that many of my previous speakers have emphasized and with you guys, again, it's just getting, you know, kind of more, getting more firmed that, you know, we need to learn Sanskrit, uh, I mean, uh, we have to learn and there is just no second thought about it. But tell me one thing, uh, how are you contributing uh, towards people around you? Because there are many people around you who would tell you that, you know, you have gone to a religion of demons and uh, devil, I don't know how they convert. I'm sure you must have seen the videos in down south and uh, in southern part of India. So how do you uh, how do you clarify? How will you if if I'm I'm one of them? How would you clarify my doubt that this is not demonic and you know the satanic? I don't know how. I think these are the words they use, isn't it? So how how much um, emphasis you can give and how would you explain to them? Okay, um, 
So I guess this feeds into the bigger issue of the survival of Hindus generally, actually, and what are the strategies we need to put in place to ensure the survival? Because as Dhruv Paya was saying at the beginning, there are so many um, benefits, not just on an individual level, but on a, sort of a global level that could come about if Hinduism could prosper and spread. And I'm not talking about, you know, that sort of like neo-Hinduism that actually most Hindus actually are. It's not, you know, classical Hinduism. It's where they're all saying, you know, all religions are the same and all this. And you know, I might touch on that a bit later. Um, but to really revive strong classical Hinduism, because it is so important that not only on you know, the survival of the world, when it comes to you know, environmental sustainability, animal welfare, human happiness and health, as we've heard, you know, one in six people in the UK are on antidepressants. You know, this cannot continue getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and Hinduism really has so much to offer. So how can we ensure the, not only the survival, but the, that Hinduism prospers? Um, so what I'll do now actually is I will reflect on what I have observed um, of Hindus in the UK, because certainly in India, there's a really big problem with um, ensuring Hindus are you know, true Hindus. They are classical Hindus who actually know anything about the Shastras. And I look at my Indian family and I'm always shocked that I know so much more than them. Like anything I mention, they just don't, they don't know anything and they feel the need to kind of explain really basic things to me. I'm like, oh my goodness, like, is this really your level of understanding of Hinduism? And this is somebody who's only discovered Hinduism a few years ago, you know? Um, but in the UK, I would say that in many ways, the situation is even um, harder for Hindus because they are, you know, constantly bombarded with Christian and other influences. You know, it's not, there isn't the, um, they haven't got the benefit of being on the Mithi of India, of having school friends who are Hindus. So it's even more difficult for them. So when I look at my uh, UK school friends, um, a few of them were Hindu, but I only really realized that as an adult. And I know that sounds crazy because but the problem is that and I remember now thinking, oh, is it because I was really stupid or something? Um, but no, I think it's because they literally were bending over backwards to blend in. So they never talked about India. They never talked about Hinduism. And I think that's partly because Hin Hindus, they do have this inferiority com complex, you know, past particularly down from the British Raj where the culture was just absolutely destroyed and what did remain was completely watered down and corrupted and see, just made to look really bad and inferior. So they bend over backwards to not appear Indian or Hindu. Um, and in fact, they go to the other extreme of trying to be more Western than the West even. Um, and in fact, you know, when I look back, they were some of the strongest people who would be celebrating Christmas, but the word Diwali never came up. Like, I, I literally had never heard the word Diwali until I was an adult. You know, it seems completely crazy, but it's true. Um, another example I can reflect on now, I'm actually moving to the US. Um, so we have some, on my in-laws side, we have some family in the US. And I was recently talking to slightly removed family. Um, we've only just got to know them recently. So they live in Washington, DC, and they've got a couple of young boys. And these young boys, they're nine years old. They were telling me that they are, they would never tell their friends that they are Indian because they know their friends would then just think that they are poor and strange were the words they used to me. And they never invite their friends home to play because they're scared their friends would not like the smell of the house or they might see the puja tali or something. And so they just, it's almost like they're completely wiping out their identity, completely denying themselves of their culture, who they are, and yet they're still getting bullied. And it was just so heartbreaking to hear this story of these nine-year-old boys. Um, on another side, some other US family we have, um, there, the family is really completely westernized. Um, and when we met with them recently, the father was just making fun of my husband and I, the fact that we were wanting to go to Ayodhya for Diwali. And they were saying things like, oh, you're Ram, 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 this, you're crazy. Why would you want to go to Ayodhya? And you're, you're looking at their children. You think, how on earth 
can Hinduism survive in this family? This next generation is not going to be Hindu, is it? Like, it's clearly not. And it really makes me worry about the next generation um, because I think either at worst, many of them will become Christians or Muslims. Um, and I say Christians, you know, that can be you know, a re relatively weak Christian, like most Christians in the UK, um, but it might be a very strong Christian and then co be contributing to conversion forces. Um, you only have to look at the, the UK universities and you know, attend them. I, I myself was targeted by Christian missionaries while at university, both as an undergrad and a postgrad, and saw some of my school friends become very radically Christianized. Um, while at university um, and that's dangerous because they'll be potentially contributing to that conversion force um, they'll be thinking bad things about Hindus um, promoting the idea that humans are different from all other types of life um, and they'll want to you know, ridicule Hindus because they see them as heathen and so that just plays into that inferiority complex of Hindus that's already there or they, the other side, they might end up converting into Mus into Islam um, because again, you love jihad. That's on the other side another big problem that um, we're facing. Not just in India, obviously, it's a very big problem in India, I know, but in the UK as well. When I was at university in Oxford, the uh, the grooming gangs were just two miles down the road. That whole episode was happening just two miles away. It's quite horrific. And yet, while being in Oxford, I never heard anything about it. Um, in the media, um, it was completely hushed up, but it is a growing problem. So I think at worst, they become strong Hindus, uh, strong Christians or Muslims. At best, maybe they become atheists, I feel. I don't feel it's very likely that they'll become, you know, they'll be Hindus because as I said, they all they're hearing is negativity about Hindus completely and they don't know anything about it. Um, and at least maybe as atheists, perhaps they might still be able to live a dharmic life that doesn't interfere with Hindus. So they might become vegetarians and care for the environment. So I almost feel like that's the best scenario to hope for them. But in the middle is that they become, that they sort of stay in this sort of like univer universalistic Hindu um, mindset that actually I think is very prevalent um, even among you know, Hindu leaders unfortunately when I watch some videos from you know Sadhguru or Sri Sri Ravi Shankar it honestly it makes me cringe like they put up pictures of Jesus and they'll be talking about the devas as angels and you're like oh my goodness people what are you doing <laughs> you are only aiding conversions um, and it all feeds into this whole universalism idea of Hinduism. It's completely false. It's a completely post-colonial idea that came about because the British Raj were trying really hard to water down Hinduism and to Christianize it. And actually the Hindus, unfortunately at that time, they were kind of playing into their hands because they were so desperate to um, be accepted by their colonial masters, that they were allowing it to happen and actually aiding and abetting it. Um, and then obviously since the British Raj, just the remainder of missionaries and all the money that's pouring in from different missionary organizations, even to today, um, it's a real, real problem. This idea that is being promoted within Hinduism that all religions are the same because actually it's complete nonsense um it's actually it's completely anti-hindu dharma it's not even logical because what they're saying is we are not superior therefore we are superior we're not superior because we're the only ones who know that all religions are the same but because we know that we are superior so it's a completely illogical like center <laughs> Theme to the whole idea of universal Hinduism. As I said, it's a completely post-colonial um, trend. And I think it's actually one of the strongest issues that Hinduism faces because when the Hindus themselves are destroying Hinduism, then all the attacks from external sources are just, it plays into their hands so easily and then they can pick off people and convert them. It's just so easy. So um, yes, that was my quick spiel about 
No, okay. I worry about. I got, I got the answer. I got the answer. So I think um, uh, obviously we have run uh, quite. Uh, out of time, but I still have quite a few questions to ask uh, Dhruv as well. So Dhruv, I wanted to know, being a lawyer, how did Bhagavad Gita help you to uh, improvise your uh, uh, work performance? You know, I mean, how can you connect Bhagavad Gita to your professional life? Because here we want to tell people that if you read Bhagavad Gita, it is definitely going to help you in all aspects of life. So you being you know, full time working as a lawyer, and I'm facing the world uh, head on. So please give me some idea, some tips, basically, to our youth, that when you read Bhagavad Gita, this is the benefit you get in pointers, because I want them to improvise their life with the help of Bhagavad Gita, especially the professional life. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Vaishali ji. So uh, my journey of studying the Bhagavad Gita happened before I became a lawyer. Um, so it was a very, very long time ago, 2008, when I went traveling around the world and I read the philosophies of many different cultures and many different societies. But it was when I encountered the Bhagavad Gita, I actually picked it up in, uh, in Prague when I went to Eastern Europe, uh, my first copy of the Bhagavad Gita in, at the um, Hare Krishna temple, uh, which is not an authentic version of the Gita, as everybody knows, it's a sectarian one, but it was the first one I picked up. Um, and it made me a shot when the first time I read it because um, I thought it was a religious scripture, I thought it was a scripture about rituals, but here it's Sri Krishna telling Arjun, who has his family members on the other side, his teachers on the other side, he says, kill them, fight them, and I was absolutely shocked when I read it for the first time, it's such a, um, uh, whenever you're faced with challenging decisions in life to make in life where there's no right answer, the Bhagavad Gita teaches us that it's never life is never crystal clear, life is never black and white, uh, within these conflicting decisions, within conflicting circumstances, where you have to make not so much of a moral decision, but a life decision, what decision do you make? And I always see the Bhagavad Gita as a psychological treatment of Arjun. So the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is known as Vishad Yog, uh, which means the despondency of Arjun, he went through various different stages before Parishya Vachanantava, I'm ready according to your word, he told Sri Krishna. And um, what kind of it taught me is that in life, whenever we're faced with um, difficult circumstances, when we don't know what to do, the Bhagavad Gita gives us that, that guidance. In my career, I've never had to face too many moral issues. I feel that the legal profession, I think the mergers and acquisitions world that I work in is, is quite clean. It's, it's quite, people are generally quite nice. It's a very adversarial profession. Um, but people are very professional. They're hardworking people that, like Eve G and Melissa G, have studied well, have done well, um, but can sometimes be quite materialistic. I felt what Melissa G said, it re resonates with me a lot. When I actually started dealing with the Hindu community, a lot of the vices that you see in the world, I actually saw in the charity world, in the Indian community, for people who are meant to be Hindus but are not, rather than my own world. In the legal profession, I was always very proud of my identity about who I was. Um, when I went out to network with clients, I would network with people from all across the world. People would always talk about superficial things when they try to win clients. I always actually try to talk about deep things. Like if someone's from, let's say Russia, I'd want to know about their culture. And at the same time, I tell them about my own culture because I'm very proud of my identity. So learning the Bhagavad Gita more and more enabled me to tell people exactly who I am, what's my identity, which people didn't know. Um, when I qualified as a lawyer in 2011, I, um, I set up kind of a network for Hindus where we started giving our talks to the Bhagavad Gita. And I received incredible amount of support from Western people um, because they still saw I was proud of my identity and they were proud of what Hinduism offers. But I saw a lot of obstacles amongst Hindus, as Melissa G said again, who tried whenever um, in ancient times, the rishis tried to do yagna, the, what we call the, the asuras always come to disrupt the yagna. So, so many people tried to actually interrupt our Gita talk. So after three years, 140 classes, we completed the entire Bhagavad Gita talks of 225 hours. Um, so um, it was especially because of the And what it taught them is that in order to be successful in life, um, it's not about um, chasing objects and running after objects. 
Um, so in chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna describes that yoga is not just about doing postures or breathing, whatever. It's yoga, goshalyam, it's excellence in what you do. So when you seek to achieve excellence in everything you do, um, there's this beautiful story um, that is given. There was a, a, a child who used to do shoe polishing on the trains in India. Um, but whenever um, people were doing the shoe polishing, they got bored and so they decided, I don't want to wait here. So he always used to buy the newspapers from the day and he used to give them newspapers so they would read the newspapers while he shines the shoes. So the excellence in what we do is very, very important. And when we achieve excellence in what we do, that's what yoga is. Um, the Bhagavad Gita teaches us how to concentrate our mind um, and not to run after our thoughts. We very much operate by default. Um, if someone from the outside tells us something like bad, uh, we get upset. If someone that from the outside tells us we're good, um, if you want to see a woman have a kind of 100 megawatt light bulb shine on her face, you can tell her she's beautiful. We operate by default, but the Gita teaches us instead of operating by default, operate by design. Um, the Gita also teaches us there's various uh, ways in which we approach tasks. Um, we can approach tasks um, it, by, by way of um, seeing tasks as work. When we see tasks as work, we're just working with our bodies. Um, then beyond that, um, you can um, approach tasks as an artisan, like a carpenter. When you're working as a carpenter, you're using your mind as well as your body. What the Bhagavad Gita teaches us is not to work as a, a worker or an artisan, but work as an artist. When an artist performs, he performs, Eve G knows because that's a background, they perform with the heart. So you perform not just with your body, not just with your mind, but with your heart as well. Um, the Bhagavad Gita teaches us how to be fearless um, in what we do. When Sri Krishna describes the qualities of the devs and the asuras in chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita, the first quality of an asura, um, at what we call wrongly translated as a demon, but it's Asura. The first quality of Asura is not someone who steals or do, the first quality of Asura is dumb, dumba, which means ostentation, hypocrisy. A person who says, I'm this on the outside, but it's something completely different. Um, how amazing is that? The characterization of what an Asura is, and it comes up with other qualities uh, such as harshness, arrogance, and so on, anger. Then Sri Krishna goes on to describe the devas. The first quality of a, a divine person is fearlessness. If you've done nothing wrong, you've got nothing to fear. Um, so that's what's beautiful with the Bhagavad Gita. It also, when it comes to our relationships with others, I work in a very adversarial profession as a lawyer. But when you um, kind of learn from the Bhagavad Gita, you see things not in an adversarial way, but people working together to achieve a common solution, which is to get a transaction done. So I often find myself working with other people and within my own team in a, in a very friendly way. And the way I'm able to do that is by chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita, which teaches us devotion. And again, uh, when Sri Krishna describes the qualities of an ideal devotee, he doesn't say someone that has still up, someone goes to a temple or someone prays every day. The first uh, quality of an ideal devotee is someone who has no ill will being towards any other human being. How, what an incredible revolutionary um, Sri Krishna is to describe a devotee in that way. Second is not just having no ill will being, but Friendliness is the second quality he gives in chapter 12. So you can have no ill will towards someone, but you can ignore them completely. But no, it's the friendliness. Then he describes the compassion, even mindedness. So there are certain qualities where if we imbibe in our lives, we can achieve not just excellence in our career, but enhance relationships with other people and also concentrating our mind better, be, being fearless. And there's a story of great people who would assess like Marcus Aurelius, um, of the Stoic philosophy, he used to always analyze himself before he went to bed every single night. If we can analyze ourselves, how we do against certain qualities, um, it enhances us not just um, in our success, but as a character. Um, the Bhagavad Gita is all about character building. And I see these very, very subtle distinct people think that MA world, the corporate world is all bad, and charity is all good. But I've seen very lovely people working in the corporate field, people who studied hard during school, who chief success who want to achieve success with their family they're decent people whereas in the charity world i've seen a lot of negativity that people want to achieve fame people who are adharmic who want to destroy hindu dharma um, and so it's a very very starting contrast that you don't need to work for a charity to be a good person you can be a person in a suit 
um, in a three-piece suit and sealed still be a, a sadhu. And the perfect example of that is given in chapter three of the Bhagavad Gita, where Sri Krishna says, as a great person does, other people do as well. And the only person Sri Krishna uses as an example of a great person in Gita is King Janaka, Videha, the, the father of Sita. He was surrounded in a palace. Um, um, Sukhdev, who wrote the Srimad Bhagavad, went to study um, from him um, for the education because he, even though he was surrounded by a palace, he was a completely detached person. And there's a story of Yagna Volka, who was his guru. And there's also, um, he had other gurus as well, but Yagna Volka was the main one. And there was a story of the time where his other disciples were scared. Why did he give so much emphasis on to um, Janakya when he was living in a palace? He said, you'll find out one day. Uh, a couple of days later, um, it was told to Janak that your entire kingdom is in flames. He gave the phrase that my kingdom is in flames, but nothing of mine is in flames. And a few years, a few days later, all these monks um, who were complaining that he lives in the palace, they were told them that your clothes have gone. They started running around left, right, center, panicking. So this person had a massive palace and it went to the flames. He didn't care. Whereas these people who had nothing, their, their clothes just disappeared and they were running into panic. And so it's not about what you wear if you're a monk on the outside. It's about who you are on the inside. And that's what the Bhagavad Gita is so powerful for. And it's not just me speaking about the Bhagavad Gita. If you look all around the world, the CEOs of major corporations are turning towards the Bhagavad Gita. The art of war by Sun Tzu has not worked. Um, the uh, days of the Wall Street film and all that is, has not worked. And th those days are over. People are looking towards compassionate um, corporatism. And that's where the Bhagavad Gita comes in. And if you look at the CEOs of every major American company, they are all Hindu um, and Indian. And they've been brought up in the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. If you look at the Google CEO, if you look at the Microsoft CEO, uh, the MasterCard, um, Pepsi, you name it, all the companies, HCL, there are Hindus and people are turning towards that philosophy because it not only leads to material success, um, but also towards success in spiritual life. And that last point is very important. We're never life negative Hindus. We always worship Ma Lakshmi as well. Um, and if you read the Sri Rudram, they say, Jame, Jame, I want this, I want this, because I want to use it for the purpose of my yagna. Um, so it's very, very important that the success um, follows the truth. That's why we have Lakshmi Narayan. So thank you. Wonderful. I'm so happy uh, to, you know, always, I'm, I'm always happy to hear you because I know that you would give me a wonderful answer, the one, the way I'm looking, uh, looking for. So now we have a question for Melissa G uh, from someone from the UK. He has said that, can I put forward a question if I may, uh, may please, how can we overcome this discrimination in the UK towards the minority, which includes Hindus? This is the reason Hindus are afraid to speak up. Personally, I'm very vocal and proud Hindu and always preaching about Hinduism. And I still encompass discrimination, especially at workplaces and places of socializing, which is very sad. So, Malisa ji, um, what kind of tips you would like to give to those Hindus, those who have tried the way you said they, they are underplaying, they, under, they underplay their religion, they underplay their customs, traditions. So, how can you uh, empower them? How can you give them this idea that they can wear the badge of Hinduism very proudly and still be British and still be there in London and still be there in a pub and still be doing whatever they want to do. Absolutely. I think you got it spot on there by Charlie G when you were saying it's about empowering the Hindus because the other angle is that you could try and influence the rest of the UK to better understand Hindus in a sort of like a, a policy way perhaps you know or even a simple way of you know, changing the RE textbooks, because what children are taught about Hinduism, if they are taught about Hinduism, I wasn't, for example, in my school, um, if they are, it's a load of rubbish, really. It's just, it's not at all, uh, um, it doesn't re um, represent Hinduism at all. Um, and that would be a much more difficult way to go about things because you know, the people writing the textbooks, the policy makers, they are going to be always looking at the world through an Abrahamic lens and by consulting texts written by colonist minds. Um, so that way, yeah, that is an option, but it's a much longer strategy. Whereas yes, now Hindus 
in the in today can do something to sort of help this problem um, and so one concrete thing I would say is to if any Hindu is saying this to stop saying that Hinduism is a way of life um, and not a religion because and I'm sure Drupaya will have plenty to say on this, but from a legal point of view, if we just focus on, you know, practically from a legal point of view, it puts Hindus in no legal position. Um, if, there, if you are experiencing some discrimination, if you're saying, well, it's not a religious discrimination, it's a discrimination on my way of life, that's not a protected characteristic. Um, you've got no legal base basis to be saying this. So please stop saying it's a way of life. Um, Another concrete thing is to sort of try and understand your enemies. Again, as Tripai was saying earlier, um, within Hinduism, we are you know, going out to war. Um, you know, the Gita is spoken out on the battlefield. We are warriors, each and every one of us. And so we need to be clever. We need to have strategies and as to, as to how to overcome this discrimination. And the thing is, you can't overcome a problem until you understand what is causing that problem. And that means you need to understand your enemies. And if these enemies are you know, the Christian mindset, the, the Muslim mindset, we need to understand that so that we can um, have robust, strong answers to counter when we are experiencing this discrimination. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this universalist, this universalist mindset is really damaging in this regard because it allows Hindus to justify the discrimination or to accept it and it just isn't acceptable it's not acceptable for us for Hindus to be called heathen or kafir and for others to say that we are damned to a hell in for all eternity you know, where is the proof that we are damned to a hell for all eternity because we don't read the bible we may be you know, wonderful people doing fantastic things for the world why should we be damned so yeah, we all need to understand this with, or Hindus need to understand this with much more clarity. They really do not at the moment. And then an appeal really to Hindu parents is to raise their children as strong Hindus. And in the first instance, that means they need to become strong Hindus, that they are then equipped to produce strong children and then spend quality time with them. I remember for Durga Puja last year, um, I attended an event where all of the children were running around outside because their parents didn't want to deal with them. And it's so different from when I remember being at church, we had to sit still and listen and you know, absorb what was being said. Sometimes there would be like a Sunday school on, but you would still be learning what the ad your parents were learning, but just in a child friendly format. The, children, the Hindu children I see, they're just running like, <laughs> running around like headless chickens outside you know they're not gaining anything they're not getting any benefit from attending that event and that's really really sad um another way that parents can set themselves as a role model to their children to be activated hindus who want to protect hinduism and and don't take nonsense lying down um, so a recent episode um, on social media in the UK that went quite well recently was um, there was a stand against Amazon UK because they're selling many products at the moment of you know Bhagavan Ganeshji on a doormat or on a doormat or you know these sorts of things and I saw that some of the 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 um, critical people in response to these this advertising on social media of this issue were Hindus themselves saying, oh, oh, it's nothing much to worry about. Why are you getting so exercised about this? You know, we do Rangoli on the floor. You know, it's okay to put Om on the floor, but it's like, yes, but that's not putting your feet on Om. It's not putting your feet on Bhagavan Ganeshji. So if Hindus themselves aren't seeing the discrimination at times, it's just weakening and allowing the Abrahamic faiths and others to exploit us. And my final, final point is to please for Hindu parents to encourage their children to become MPs or politicians, you know, or sorry, journalists, and not just doctors and engineers, um, because we need to be, you know, creating new narratives. We need to be politicizing so that we can stand up against discrimination against Hindus um, much more easily. At the moment, it's completely impossible because we have no 
sort of role models out there who can speak for us and actually be heard on a, you know, a national level, for example. So we need to create these positions. So I feel there's a huge responsibility on Hindu parents at the moment to ensure that this discrimination doesn't continue. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'm so glad that being British, you are giving this narrative, giving this idea and the uh, pathway that this is how we want to, uh, we should go because uh, very correctly you said that we have to have people in media and politics so that they can defend uh, uh, all this discrimination happening against Hindus. So I think we had a wonderful time talking about this topic and I'm so glad to have you uh, you know, you guys on this page. Earlier, I had thought of only through because I did not know about you. It's like uh, having, you know, <laughs> what do you say? Ek pe do free? <laughs> what do you say, Drew? <laughs> it, it is a Black Friday sale. So, yes, I want to get to free. <laughs> but it's so wonderful to know Melissa Ji and Eve Ji both because uh, this is the first time I'm, I'm interacting with you. With Drew, it's, it's different because we met personally also in London so many times and uh, I've been following his work for a, quite some time. I've been part of the groups and um, uh, I've had wonderful experiences while sharing your uh, talks in, in India on my Indian number. So when I forward, so I think I get very good uh, response from people and which is very nice. And that's the reason I'm sure that uh, they already know you as in when I posted about uh, our uh, this talk today, quite a few people commented that, yes, yes, we know him, yeah. And that's a good thing because we need to reach out to more people. We are the warriors. We have to ensure that we don't get bowed down by anything. I have so many struggles. I have so many issues in my personal front, but I've ensured that I'm sitting here and I'm doing this work, which I really want to do. And uh, I'm so glad that, you know, I'm, I'm actually getting strength from you guys. You know, I'm really weak, this Diwali thing and coming here and packing, but I think I'm really charged up today. <laughs> So I'm sure this will help me to take forward my work as well. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, anything uh, last, anything, any last word you would like to say, please? There's one last thing. Drew Ji, yeah, there's just one last thing. I've been dying over here listening to Melissa G. And I think we would just be absolutely failing if we didn't just for five minutes here. You had mentioned something very important, and um, it's a, you mentioned the South Indian gods and goddesses, the frightening look. You mentioned Satan, which comes from the word shaitan. It's an Arabic derivative. It has nothing to do with India. And I've often heard Melissa G and Drew G both. Melissa G is very good at describing this the protective attribute of God, the, or the conscious, that, that infinite consciousness. So you see these goddesses and gods with fangs, and they look frightening. But if you look at nature, you have tigers, you have lions, if you are divided, if you, the Abrahamic religions work off of making you feel impure, right? All those, all those murtis, oh, the statue, they're black. Black has been vilified, yet black is the color of a fertile woman's hair. And this, you know, gray is the color of age, white is the color of death. <laughs> I mean, we are so turned around with what's pure and impure, black fertile soil. The night is black. You know, this is, it's, it, you, it's cloaked with blackness. So what we're seeing here is that the Hindu, the the Hindu dharma, which also even the word Hindu, I had a, a lovely person bring that up to me on Facebook. The word Hindu, everyone just keeps repeating that, repeating that without even knowing you were also speaking to language. Um, it's not the original, it, it just got labeled, someone saying something wrong and then Indians just being so laid back. India is la in a way laid back, like Melissa G is saying, oh, it's universal, this is a way of life. And then they don't even care, you call them Hindus, fine, we're Hindus. And it's not even the original word for the Dharma. And, and Sanatana Dharma is only one branch of what it is to be a Hindu. But Sindhu, the river, I mean, it's, it's just all of it scrambled, including your sense of identity based on these old Murthys. Black was sacred. Black was sacred. Fangs were protective. It's like a tiger or lion. Kartikeya was a warrior god. He's, he is 
He is the protector. Now he's only in the south. Really, I mean, it's where you see him. He's he's banished from the. It's all brainwashing. So I wanted to just comment on this. The last part is if anyone is familiar with the Western identity of the devil, of Satan. Melissa G, you already know this, right? <laughs> it's not what the tree shul. It is a vilification of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva's sacred duty is the recycling of matter. He's a lord of fear because of that. We're afraid of change. These Abrahamic religions come and they make it the devil. So once again, they separate you from who you really are. You're a being of change. So anything destructive is now evil. And, and even the word destruction in English does not do justice to who Lord Shiva is. It's, it's almost a crime to use the word. And I, I just had to speak for Lord Shiva because that imagery just murders me um, <laughs> when I see that. And that is the classic Western devil. It almost looks like a Shiv, a Shiv dude or a Shiv gun, like one of the servants. It's almost like this image of the devil is nothing but a servant of Bhairava. And it, I mean, this is how sacred the land of India is worshipped. You worshipped. I mean, you had the fearlessness to worship in the crematory because that is the ultimate humility. You can't wage a war without understanding death. Not properly. You have to understand that you, you will die and people you love will die. You have to understand the consequence. Lord Shiva is the consequence. So in South India, you have actually very pure representations of Shiva and Shakti that have this tree shul. So, I mean, this is a very powerful force of nature. So anyway, I wanted to say that and if they had anything to add to that, because the word Hindu, the vilification of Lord Shiva by the, the image of, of the devil, the word Shaitan, I mean, it's Arabic. It has nothing to do. Christians don't even know this. They don't even know what they're talking about. Their idea of God, I, this is, it's very much like Indra. It's like Zeus, like a God in the sky. And then there's a devil below. It's once again, you're very divided. All of this is di divided. Once you're divided, you cannot claim your power. So anyway, in the vilification of black, I just, I have to just lay myself down, my heart down that people readjust their understanding of that. The reason you wear white for spirituality is you're dead to the world. You're smeared in ash. <laughs> this is Lord Shiva's ash that I'm wearing. It has <laughs> nothing to do with white being pure. White is the easiest color to get dirty. You sure. know, we need to think about this stuff. Lord Shiva is shown as white, right? We need to think about these things in a deeper way. All colors are sacred. And when you start vilifying something, you really question it. The minute you start getting something caught in your head that it's dirty and ugly and soiled or what, please think that there's some kind of warping of the, of the mind and the thoughts as Sri Patanjali mentions in the Yoga Sutra, something's warping. It's not the correct way of simplistic thought. Your mind embraced by nature is receptive and embraces everything, really. We embrace night and day. There's no judgment. Judgment gets a certain kind of brain wave working actually that's destructive to intelligence, which is interesting because it means you have something to defend. The minute you have something to defend, this is where your energy goes. Real wisdom is first gained through observance. It shouldn't have judgment in it. So if you look at these Murtis, these South Indian deities, I just want to say that there's something very sacred in that imagery and to not be disconnected from it out, out of fear or shame. These religions often work off of shame and, and it, they'll get you that way. So, okay, thank you. I just, I couldn't leave without saying that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Eve G. Uh, Drew, anything you would like to share? Um, yeah, no, just to want to say thank you for um, hosting us, Vaishalaji. I bet you a number of years before, um, and we, we've kept our friendship for a long, long time. And thank you for continuing to share our talks and to promote what we do amongst your followers and your fans. And um, no, it's been an absolute delight, all of us coming together to celebrate one of my favorite festivals and make <laughs> sure that everyone celebrates that festival on the, December the 25th, because it's a special day, it's a special time of year with the winter solstice as well. Um, and just want to pass my blessings to everyone that may they study the Bhagavad Gita and may they take 
the warrior stand of spirituality because we've lost that warrior mindset. It's both Yuki and Melissa G described. Um, it's very, very important to describe ourselves as warrior because there's a battle we encounter in life. People think that this life is a wonderful world. No, it's a, it's a battlefield. This life, when you go through a spiritual journey, you want to feel good about yourself, feel good about the world. But no, it's, a, it's very much a battlefield. There's not been a single century in the history of the world where there hasn't been a battle. Um, when you look at our Vedic traditions, they, it divides the mantra and say, Bhur, Bhuva, Swaha. We have the three worlds. We have the, 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 the space, we have like the swarg, and then we have the earth. The, the uh, space is ruled by the sun because the sun is the center of the solar system. If you look at swarg, it's ruled by Indra. Indra comes from Indriya, which is the senses, which is all about Shukra, which is Venus. Whereas mm -hmm. this world, this earth, is Bhumi. Uh, the Bhumi Putra is Mars. This world is all about Mars. The most lucrative business in the world is the defense business because that's what life is. It is a battle. Every animal creature struggles for that battle. So as Hindus, we shouldn't be afraid of battle. We shouldn't be afraid of confrontation. And if any scripture teaches us not to be afraid of confrontation, it's the Bhagavad Gita, where what Arjun thought was Adharma. Sri Krishna said, it's dharma. You have to fight that battlefield. And in any circumstance in life, whether you're facing discrimination at work, I, the reason why I started giving my first talk was for two reasons. First of all, to stop uh, rampant conversions that were taking place. But also, secondly, is that someone at workplace um, made fun of me for worshipping what he called an elephant god. And I explained to him it was an elephant god. And I thought there's a lack of teachings and Hindus are accepting things they shouldn't accept. And so that's why I started giving those talks. So um, Hindus need to be very mentally strong. I feel that lacking Hindus are very much looking forward to the fake Buddha memes and uh, things to make them feel good. They need to make themselves mentally strong. And you do that by learning the Bhagavad Gita and toughening yourself up, um, not becoming overly emotional and not becoming overly intellectual, as Eve said, and also selecting the right guru. Um, Swami Vivekananda's guru, Ramakrishna Parahans, um, didn't speak much, but he had a direct vision of Mahakali. Ramana Maharshi didn't speak much, but he had a direct vision and he was regarded as the incarnation of Skanda, Eve described. If you find a guru has that direct vision, um, like I did, uh, my guru has a direct vision of Shakti, and I saw that um, there will be nothing in the outside world that can make you doubt yourself or your culture. Um, so it's very, very important to find the right guru, not a professor, not a theologian, uh, not an influencer, not a life coach, but a, a guru. It's a very, very important and sacred relationship. And there's a story one of my good friends said his guru used to teach in India. And he made sure that by the fourth day when he was teaching, no more than four people are left within the audience because he would offend everyone so much that only the core people are left. And those are the people he wanted to impart that knowledge to. And if you look at all the scriptures, be it Jyotish Shastra, which E.G. studied, um, if you look at the Yog Shastras, they always give the qualifications of a person who can and cannot study and a person who can and cannot teach. And these things require tapasya. You have to go through that tapas, you have to go through that heat. And it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a cleansing process. And also importantly, never feel that you're powerless. Um, you feel, may feel you're inconsequential in this world, but you, you as one person may have 2,000 friends. Each of those people have 2,000 more friends. And so the message um, you speak and the truth you speak is very, very important. You should speak the truth no matter what the consequences will be. And whatever consequences happen to you for speaking the truth will be the best thing that could possibly happen to you. And by receiving um, all sorts of criticism and so on from people, that is your strengthening process. That is your tapasya because you're performing this yajna and that will make you stronger for what's to come. And so it's very, very important that you speak the truth no matter what and not worry about the repercussions. As children of Ma Saraswati, we don't take kindly to people trying to silence our voice. Never, never be silenced um, by people who are your enemies. Um, because as uh, Melissa G said, even if you try to play by the book, try to fit in, they'll still do the same. Um, they hate your existence. And when someone hates your existence, they don't care if you uh, try to become like them or not. Um, without your identity, you are absolutely nothing. So preserve your identity, protect your identity, it's the longest surviving culture in the world. 
and I'd like to finish with one more thing is that intelligence is not doing new things. Intelligence is doing things in the way they've always been done. People think they're doing things intelligently because they're starting something new. Um, but the fact that something's been around for so long means it works. So that's why it's so important to respect our traditions. And um, yeah, like um, Evji and Melissa, I share concerns with a lot of the Hindu youth. And the only way you eradicate those concerns is in the family environment to encourage that kind of behavior and to fight against a dharma within the family environment first and then in the wider environment. And you fight a dharma by four things. You do the puja together as a family. It's very important. Once a day, do the puja together as a family. Um, secondly, um, you should have the conversations. Be free to have these um, conversations. People um, are afraid to have conversations about difficult subjects, but you should be able to have these conversations. Um, thirdly, you should be able to um, travel together on a yatra as a family. That's very, very important because when you do that, you're... you're embrace in this culture and the divinity of India, um, it, it, it's really, really important. And also, try as a family, sit down for one meal together. Um, those are the four pieces of advice that Sri Krishna gave Narada in the Srimad Bhagavat, of how he kept 16,000 families all together um, in, in um, happiness and bliss. So um, my best wishes to everyone and blessings to everyone on the auspicious um, festival of Gita Jayanti. And lots of love to you, Vaishali Ji. Thank you for hosting us. And Thank you. All the success um, for the start of the coming um, new year. And um, we look forward to coming um, again and joining you. And uh, lots of love to all the, all the audience members. And thank you to Melissa G and Eve G for an amazing year spent together um, imparting this wisdom. Um, it's um, it's end of the year, but it's a comma, not a full stop. We've got many, many more things to do <laughs> when the next festivals come. So, Jay Sri Krishna, thank you. Thank you, Jay Sri Krishna, to both of you with all three of you and I'm so happy uh, to know other two ladies, these two beautiful scholars at the same time, this, uh, those uh, enlightened souls, actually, I should be saying that because, you know, being scholar is still a little, li little lesser than being enlightened. So thank you so much. Uh, I think this is the time for sign off and I'm so happy to have you guys. Thank you so much. Namaste. 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 Thank you. Thank you.